Welcome to the Evanston Public Library's Beginning Birding for Everyone. My name is Julie Rand, and I'm the ecology librarian at the Evanston Public Library. Also, I'm an avid birder, and so I roped my friend Scott Judd into talking about birding because he's been my birding teacher and birding mentor since I started birding, was it three years ago, Scott? Three years ago. Lisa. So I met Scott at the Bizazian Library when he did uh, his first ever presentation on beginning birding. And we found out we shared a love of live music, obviously birding. We actually live in the same part of Chicago and we uh, have gone birding together. Um, my husband is a birder, his wife is a birder. So we've even braved the Morton Arboretum at sub-zero temperatures in, I think it was December, right, Scott? So, it was. so I'm going to turn things over to Scott. Once again, mics off, video off. Please direct your questions to chat. This will be recorded and I will be sending out information tomorrow. So thanks, Scott, take it away. All right, thank you, Julie. Thanks everybody for coming. It's a wonderful turnout on a nice Thursday night. It's so nice out, I feel a little bad. We're not all just doing this out in a amphitheater in the woods somewhere, but this is the next best thing. Um, I've got a slide deck that I'm gonna use to guide the um, discussion here. Like Julie said, there'll be fielding questions. So I'm gonna pause periodically every few slides and we'll kind of take some questions as we go. But what I'd really like to do is just kind of get through the deck too and get to the end and get into a little more Q&A there. So we'll just see how it goes. Um, the um, view I think is completely up to you. I'm gonna share my screen. In fact, I'm gonna do that right now and you'll start seeing my slides and how you juggle between seeing me or seeing the slides completely up to you. Uh, every picture in the slide that you see of a bird is one that I have taken myself in Chicago. I will try to remember to tell you what they are. That's been a feedback on a past presentation that uh, people want to hear what they are. So right out front here, that is a Baltimore Oriole on our fence with our neighbor's four-year-old's uh, badminton net behind it. And uh, I have a lot of pictures of birds on that fence. It's a great spot for migrants to prop up and... Uh, that bird particularly was eyeing the orange slices that I put up on top of my bird feeder stand and uh, Baltimore Orioles love to come in and eat oranges in the spring. So I actually just put them out a couple days ago. I was hoping I'd have a fresh picture from today, but they didn't show up yet, but they will be here any minute. Uh, so this is birding for everyone. So this is uh, kind of birding 101. I'm not gonna get super advanced. My goal here is to uh, get those of you who've expressed an interest by showing up, uh, on a path if you need some simple tactics or just uh, some structure for how to get going that's what we're going to do we're going to talk about bird books and talk about binoculars in fact i've got a uh, a whole little agenda slide here that uh, this is to give you a high level on what we're going to do so i'll talk a little bit about just why are people fascinated by birds why is chicago a great place to bird and it is truly a great place to bird um, why do birds migrate and why do we care that's going to be a theme that i repeatedly hit throughout the night. It's a really big part of being a birder and being a birder in Chicago. Uh, we'll talk specifically uh, about binoculars and bird guides and apps and things like eBird, which are Im very important and very useful tools to help you get more out of your birding experience and, and to help you get better at birding. Um, I'm gonna talk about where you can get started birding around Chicago. There's lots of options, I'll hit on a few. Talk about some good birds to focus on. There's an awful lot of birds out there. You don't want to try to go find everything at once. So you kind of attack some groups and uh, I'll give you a little bit of guidance there. I'm going to talk about listening. Your ears are just as important as your eyes as a birder, possibly more important. The really good birders I know, the ears are huge. The ears are a big part of the experience. And uh, that's something I'm still working on myself. I get a little better at it each year. So I'll give you a little bit of guidance on that. And then at the very end, we'll talk quickly about Chicago bird collision monitors, and we'll talk a little bit about bird photography and cameras. And I think I've also even got a slide in there about feeders. So that's what we're gonna do. And without further ado, let's get doing it. So why do people watch birds? Um, the thing I like to say is birds are important. They really are. They reflect um, our environment. They reflect the health of our ecosystem. They are nomads. Many birds traverse many state lines, many country lines, many uh, ecosystem lines, environmental lines. 
uh, birds were here, you know, doing their thing a long time ago and they're still doing it. And now here we are building skyscrapers and flying planes and putting up cell towers and all that fun stuff. And that all impacts birds and uh, our awareness of birds in our own universe as humans and all things we do in, in our own space, uh, which is really their space uh, for my money, um, to me makes them important. And uh, I think having an awareness of them will, will connect you to nature in a, in a new and deeper way. It certainly has for me and for all the birders I know. Uh, it's also a great deal of fun. It's also challenging. There's an enormous amount of information to know. And I'm just going to help you put a toe in the water tonight. We're not shooting for 400 level. We're shooting for just getting started and, and getting comfortable with some of the basics. And um, the best thing about it is it really is challenging. It's, it, it exercises your brain, it exercises your eyes, exercises your ears, and it gets you outdoors. So it exercises your body. So for me, being a birder is a very healthy activity. You know, I love to sit and watch TV and eat ice cream with the best of them. But uh, getting outside, watching birds, walking around, figuring out what's what, getting things in my binoculars, listening to their calls. I think that that really bolsters my own health mentally and physically. And especially after a year of COVID-19 and being trapped at home and not seeing our friends and family, birding for me was a saving grace. Honestly, it kept me going. I birded more last year maybe than I ever have, uh, as did a lot of people I know. And I think one of the reasons we have 100 plus people here tonight is that uh, word is spreading, that it's a, it's a great way to go. It's a great thing to do. And uh, so we'll talk a lot about why it's why it's cool, why it's fun, why it's important. But uh, it's also just it can't be said enough that birds are not just a pretty thing to look at. Birds really have meaning. They are a big part of the natural environment that we live in. And I think the more of us that know about them and care about them and are aware of them and tell our friends and our families about them, uh, I think that's a, an important thing to do. And, so hopefully I'll help you all get going on that if you're not doing it already. It's also something you could do your whole life. I started birding when I was about this big and I'm now this big and I'm still birding and I never, never will stop. I can't, I cannot imagine the day I'm not bird aware. Even if I am immobilized or my ears go or something in some way, shape or form, I will bird as long as I am upright. And that's how most of my birding friends feel. Uh, so it's really a great thing. Little kids can do it. Seniors can do it. Everybody in between can do it. And on that note, everybody does it in different ways. Uh, I'm going to help give you some guidance to get you rolling, but everybody find their own style. I know a lot of birders. I know some very hardcore birders. You would be amazed how serious and how hardcore some people can get. I also know some very casual birders, people who are just look out the window and see that cardinal singing in their yard and that brings them great joy and that's all they need. Those are both perfectly valid ways to go. And there's a lot of range in between them. And some of the things we'll talk about will help maybe put you on your own path to figure out what your birding style is going to be. And you'll also find it evolves. Mine's evolving. Mine's a lot different now than it was 10 years ago. And it's a ton different than it was 25 years ago. But I've been doing it the whole time. That's the great thing. So how did I get into bird watching? Uh, this really starts with my mom and my grandmother. Uh, grandfather. Rather. I grew up in southern Connecticut in a town called Stanford. We lived on Big Oak Road. It's a wonderful place to be a kid. We had oak trees everywhere. We grew up on an acre lot in the woods and all the other houses had that same acre lot and that same woods. And as kids, we were out making little dams in the streams and going fishing and making dirt bike jumps in the woods and whatnot. And uh, all this translated into there being an awful lot of birds around all the time. And my mom and her dad always had feeders up. So we became very bird centric just through the feeders at a very early age. Mom trained us tufted titmouse, black cap chickadee, white-breasted nuthouch, downy and hairy woodpecker, occasionally pileated woodpecker. That was like the thriller, the big, big woodpecker. We'd hear it, they had a crazy call or when they're pounding, it was very loud. My whole family would stop what we were doing to go run to the window or run out on the deck and go see the pileated. So I really can't remember a day I wasn't bird aware, but I will freely admit I didn't spend a whole lot of time pounding the books, uh, nor did we really go birding. We would bird at home and we kind of see birds around town, but we didn't really consider ourselves birders. To us, it was just this natural part of life to see birds in the yard and to be able to identify them and to get excited about certain ones. Uh, it started to evolve for me on these family road trips. We went camping in Pennsylvania, so it was like a 400 mile drive. And I was a little kid, I was in the back of the car and uh, was the youngest of four and would get shoved in the way back. And I wasn't the greatest car traveler, I'd often be back there 
semi-nauseous or, or possibly fully <laughs> nauseous. And uh, what I found great solace in was noticing big birds on telephone poles and on wires, namely red-tailed hawks and the occasional turkey vulture or bald eagles. So I really started gravitating to raptors at a young age, uh, mostly thanks to those road trips. And eventually by the time I got to college, that led me to actually going out and going to some fall hawk watch sites. And I bought a book called Hawks in Flight that helps you identify hawks based on their shape from you know, hundreds of yards away when they're coming over the horizon. So I was kind of a birder up into my uh, 20s, mostly focused on raptors, I would freely admit. I was into hawks and eagles and falcons and didn't know that much about the other birds except for the ones that came to our feeders. And then all of that changed when I moved to Chicago. I moved here in 1995 and it became quickly evident to me that this really is a bird watcher's paradise, which frankly was a great relief. I moved here on a bit of a whim. Uh, I had lived in Connecticut as a kid. I lived out in Oregon for a while after college and I moved here to be closer to family, be able to get home easier. And my brother and his wife and kids were in Wheaton. And so for lots of reasons, I moved here, but really I was just following my nose. And, and frankly, when I did it, I thought, what are you doing? Why are you moving to this big concrete jungle? I was an outdoor guy, uh, liked birds, liked hiking, liked big scenery. And suddenly I'm living in the middle of this giant urban grid in the city limits. And I really questioned my sanity a little bit. And I got great relief from finding that Chicago is an insanely good place to bird. I mean, really, you could live in places in North Carolina or Kentucky maybe they get half the number of birds we get here. This is a place that gets a lot of birds. And we're going to talk about why tonight. But once I got hip to that and started meeting some bird watchers who were way further down the path than I was, and I started joining some email lists, there was a Yahoo, remember Yahoo Groups? One of the first Yahoo Groups that came up was called IBET, Illinois Birders Exchanging Thoughts. And this was anybody who wanted to could say, I saw chickadee in my yard, or I saw a hawk migration today, or I have morning doves nesting in my garage, or whatever it was. And the more I watched that, the more I realized there was a lot going on in the bird world around here that I did not know anything about. People watching winter ducks on the river, people going to hawk watch sites, specifically in the fall, and counting sometimes thousands of raptors on one day. So my interest uh, and association with birders rocketed up in a huge way. Uh, starting 96, 97, a couple of years after I got here. And by 2000, I really started going birding more. And my wife, Alyssa, got sucked right into it with me. A big watershed moment for us was that um, I bet list had a message from someone on a Saturday morning really early. I am not a morning guy. I play in bands. I like to stay up and go watch the band close the bar until three in the morning. And uh, we woke up at seven o'clock out of character one day on a Saturday. And somebody said, it is warbler city at Montrose today. There are dozens, possibly more species of warblers here today that weren't here yesterday. And we immediately grabbed our binoculars and jumped in the car and went over and spent the morning there. And there were birders everywhere. And there were birds we had never seen or ever heard of. And there were very generous people with scopes up and with books out. And we expressed interest and they welcomed us right in. And that put us on the path. That one day was a huge turning point for both of us. Uh, and as a couple, we bird a lot. Now we travel to bird. My wife's a wonderful birder. She's a fantastic spotter. I'll tell her what we're looking for. It's usually her that finds it. Uh, but as an extension of that, we started making friends with people who are on the, you know, members of Chicago Ornith Ornithological Society, Chicago Audubon Society. We've gotten to know people who are on their board. We've gotten to know people who publish bird photos and magazines and give talks on very advanced birding topics and whatnot. So there's a huge community here in addition to a huge amount of birds. And for us, it was a game changer. Uh, we're, we were and we remain big kind of members of the music scene here, but we're, we're equally entrenched in this birding scene, which when I moved here, I had no idea it existed. So that's... Hey. Hey, Scott, someone asked, what was the rarest bird you've ever spotted in Chicago? Oh, boy. It's, uh, I got to think about that for a second, because I have become a bit of a chaser. There's, you know, with the internet now, when people find rare birds, they can send up a flare and a whole lot of us and Julie, you know, I've gotten you onto some of these alert lists. Yeah. We run out and see them. I went to see a bird. It was outside Chicago, but this week. I did a three hour round trip drive down to Kendall County to see a bird called a ruff, R-U-F-F. -F. It looks like a big sandpiper. 
but it breeds in Europe and Asia. They're not even from the States. And during their migration, they just tend to fly all over the place. And they're fairly well known for showing up on the coasts, but they're much less well known for coming inland. And I know much more experienced birders than me who've been birding for decades and have never seen one. I caught wind of those, uh, one of those on a retention pond behind a very nice housing development out in Kendall County on, I think it was Monday afternoon. And I drove out there on a whim and I found it. So as far as recent memory, that rough was a very rare one. Uh, I also found on my own, without the help of anyone else, a few weeks ago, a thing called a yellow crown night heron at the Lincoln Park Zoo. There's a big rookery of black crown night herons that breed at the zoo. Beautiful birds, really cool. I call them urban penguins at a quick glance. They look like a penguin. They're very upright and they have a big stout bill and they're mostly white and they get this cool plume on their head when they're breeding. I've been a fan of them since I was a young kid. Um, and yellow crown night herons are common in places like Florida and Mexico and we've seen them there, but they're not common here. They never come this far north and if they do, they never hang around. The bird I found is still hanging around at the Lincoln Park Zoo and hundreds of birders have gone to see it and I was very proud to be the guy who actually found that and spread word and allowed uh, a whole lot of people to go get it. So uh, and Scott, the can, can you identify the birds in the picture? I believe the lower one is a tohi. Thank you. Yeah, keep reminding me. I always blow past that. Uh, did I skip any on the last slide? I want to do all of them. Don't worry about it. What's the one on the upper um, part? Oh, this is cool. That That's a Baird's sandpiper, which is a fairly rare bird that a local friend turned me on to last year. And I ran up and saw it on a beach in Evanston. And in front of it are two sanderlings. Sanderlings are very common. We see tons of them on the beach during the warmer months here. But that Baird's sandpiper is quite a rare one. That was the first one I'd ever seen. Here you have on the bottom an eastern towhee. That's the male. Beautiful birds that just come through Chicago during spring and fall. They don't breed here. I'll talk more about that migration pattern in a bit. Uh, that one is eating seed that I put on my deck. He's about five feet from my living room window. I took that picture through the window. And likewise, the one above it I took through the window. I have those oranges out there on my feeder right now. That is a female scarlet tanager. So her male is a bright red bird with black wings, very iconic, very easy to ID. People see her and say, what is that weird looking green thing? Um, she came to that orange feeder for two or three days in a row while it was pouring rain last May. It was great. So anyway, I think I've, uh, I've concluded everything I wanted to say on that last slide. We'll do the birds on this one when I get here. That top one is a magnolia warbler. Very beautiful bird. They'll be showing up. I haven't seen my first one yet this year, but they come every May. They're moving north. They're going to breed up um, somewhere, probably up in Canada. And uh, of the warblers we see here in Chicago, they're not uncommon. You see a lot of them, but to me, they are uncommonly beautiful and it never gets old seeing them, even if you see hundreds of them in a spring, which I hope to do in the coming weeks. Below that is another great spring migrant that I really love. It's a yellow-bellied sapsucker. It's a woodpecker. We have native woodpeckers that live here and breed here, like downy woodpecker and hairy woodpecker. These guys just pass through. They breed way up north. They do not breed here, so we don't see them all year round. We really just see them during spring and fall, and I'm always on the hunt for them. And they showed up a couple weeks ago. I've already seen a bunch of them this year, including one yesterday afternoon while I was doing my pre-presentation chat with Julie, which was great. So I want to talk about why, why I call Chicago a bird watcher's paradise. It's... Um, Again, this game is a great surprise to me. Had I, had I known this was the case, I might have moved here sooner, but uh, I came to discover this on my own after moving here, which was a double bonus because I already had plenty of reasons to like the city. The big, big, big reason is the Mississippi Flyway and Lake Michigan. So there are hundreds of species of birds that migrate north and south every year. Many of them breed up in very specific habitats in uh, the northern U.S. or mostly up in Canada or even all the way up into the Arctic up in the boreal forests of Canada. There's a lot of really big tracks of certain types of trees or certain types of shrubs or certain types of environments or ecosystems that some birds just absolutely have to have to breed. So they go up there to breed, but then winter sets in, gets very cold and they all fly south and lots of them will fly right past us. They'll, they'll keep going to the Southern US or maybe Mexico or maybe all the way to Central and sometimes South America. So these tiny birds, you know, that magnolia warbler, it's like a three and a half inch bird that weighs a, a few grams. That thing's going to fly 1,200 miles or 1,600 miles or something every spring and again every fall. It is amazing that these birds do this. And there's an Atlantic flyway. There's a Mississippi flyway, which brings birds up our way. 
And then there are flyways that take birds out west up through the Rockies or up the west coast. But we are on a particularly big one. So birds that kind of funnel up through Mexico, they'll come up through Texas. They, they want to take the shortest flight across. So a lot of them will come from like the Yucatan and fly up and come into southern Texas or that whole Gulf Coast there. And then those birds keep making their way up our way. And when they get to Lake Michigan, they have to make a decision. They don't want to fly over big bodies of water. These are tiny birds and uh, they're, they're running on limited resources. So they generally try to stay over land, uh, but the lakeshore will guide them. So a lot of these birds will split. Some go up the Indiana side, but lots of them come up the Wisconsin and Minnesota side. So that's what brings us all these birds every year that aren't year round. We do have a lot of year round birds like cardinals and house sparrows and starlings and pigeons and morning doves and ring billed gulls. So there's dozens of birds that are here year round, but there are many, many more, more birds that aren't here year round. And those are the ones that once you start birding, generally those are the ones you eventually get focused on. You become a seasonal birder, you know what's coming when, and you wanna go see them when they're here because you have a limited window to do so. And that's really the key to why Chicago, as a big city, which you wouldn't necessarily normally think would be a big nature paradise, but we get this natural phenomenon of migration coming through the city, and it drives so much action and so much activity, and the birders who get into it and get hip to what's, what's coming, what can be expected where, and what you can see in your yard, or what you can see on the lakefront, or what you can see in big parks like Montrose or Labaw Woods, um, that's, that's what kind of sets your agenda. You know, I get up and think, what time of year is it? What's up, what way is the wind blowing? Some days the wind might send you to a different place to go birding on a given day, depending on whether the wind is coming off of the lake or blowing towards it. And uh, on that note, Chicago has an enormous amount of green space, you know, for a big city with a lot of concrete and a lot of asphalt and a lot of big glass and metal buildings. We also have tons of public parks and forest preserves and beaches and boulevards and backyards even. And all of these places are good places to look for birds. And even highway light poles are a great place to look for birds. That's where I got my start in a way after getting out of my backyard, started noticing those big red-tailed hawks sitting on the light pole or the wires along the highway. So considering how urban it is here, there is a lot of uh, nature to be had and the birds know that. They have places they can safely rest and feed and in some cases breed. So that's a, a great help to our, our birding. And that's why there's so many bird watchers. There really is a huge community of bird watchers here. The Chicago Ornithological Society, Chicago Audubon, there's a North Shore Bird Club, there's Illinois Audubon, Illinois Ornithological, all kinds of groups, big and small, that will lead walks, give talks. I've given a talk like this for Chicago Ornithological Society before for their membership. And uh, once you get connected to those groups, you'll get their newsletters, you get invited to their walks, you get invited to their talks. And I very much encourage you to avail yourself of that stuff if it's of interest to you because you'll not only get a lot of free information, but your best way to advance as a birder is to go hang out with more experienced birders. And the people that lead these walks and give these talks are often quite experienced, quite knowledgeable, and you can get easy access and most of it's free. You know, it's the, you can spend a lot of money birding and I will talk about that in a little while, you know, things like this and things like this. There's a, a lot of toys you can use that you can blow your money on if you want to look at birds, but Really, all you need is a cheap pair of binoculars, a good set of ears and eyes, and you get outside on a free walk with a guy like Jeff Williamson, who leads walks at North Pond every week for years. Anybody can show up and go on that walk. That's a great way to see birds you'd probably not find on your own, or maybe you'd find them and you wouldn't know what they were. Uh, so guys like that can help you get your identification skills going, but also just help raise your awareness to find birds. Finding birds is a skill. It takes practice like anything else. And all these organizations really are there to help facilitate people doing that. And we've certainly availed ourselves of it to the point that now we're getting asked to do things for them. So we went from sort of student to teacher in our own way, which is very gratifying. I'm still learning. I have a lot of way, long way to go. Don't consider myself the world's greatest expert on birding by any means, but I do feel like I've uh, had good success. And, and my friend Julie is a good case in point, just giving... Um, folks some structure for how to attack it and just how to be aware of things. You know, I wasn't aware of migration and the fact that migration funneled through Chicago. Once I got hip to that, birding took on a whole different life for me. It, it, 
it, it changes. It's a seasonal thing that you start to cancel plans for. You know, I, I clear out hours on my work schedule. I don't make plans to do social things during good birding months. And uh, there's a lot of people out there doing that. And these local groups will help you kind of focus on when and where you should be out there. I mean, you can bird all the time and you should, but if you really wanted to focus it and go maximize your impact, there are ways to do that. And these local groups will, will help you figure that out. So as far as migration, like I said, this is really an important concept to start to get into your head. And uh, as you see it unfold, it's kind of a marvel. It's kind of a miracle. You know, look at that little bird in the upper left. That's a chestnut sided warbler. Have you ever seen such a beautiful little thing? And seriously, the thing's about the size of an egg. Um, and that's a long distance migrant that goes down, you know, maybe all the way to Mexico or Central America for the winter. And it will be up hundreds of miles north of here breeding. They haven't passed through here yet, but every year I get that bird in my yard. I see that bird out my bedroom window every spring. He'll be here in the next couple few weeks. Underneath him is a harlequin duck. That's a very rare sighting around here. My friend John found that out on Lake Michigan here in Rogers Park um, last spring. And he called me and said, I might be crazy, but I think I have a harlequin duck out my window. And I ran down there with my scope and my camera and sure enough, that's what it was. We spread the word. Again, hundreds of people flocked over here to see that bird because you could go years without seeing that guy in Chicago. Whereas the guy above, the chestnut side of warbler, very common. You can count on him coming every spring and fall. And yet they're all part of the same pattern. It's migration. They're, they're going from their winter uh, resting grounds to their northern breeding grounds. And they're flying through our city because they are on, they're the birds that run that uh, central flyway up the middle of the country. And they have made their choice. They could have gone up the Indiana side of Lake Michigan and we wouldn't have seen them, but they came up our side and then we get to see them. And a lot of them do that. So be aware of that. Start thinking about that. And as you get to know other birders, you'll notice that they're going to be watching things like radar. There's weather radar that picks birds up uh, and can predict when birding might be good. And in fact, that very thing happened earlier this week. There was suddenly a switch. The winds went from coming out of the north to coming out of the south. South winds in the spring are great. When the birds are moving, they can ride that south wind freely to get a long distance ride and show up in places like this out of nowhere. And so on Sunday and Monday, there really weren't that many birds around. Tuesday, everything blew up. All of a sudden there was just thousands of birds in Chicago that weren't here. And many of them weren't gonna stick around. In fact, many of them didn't. But I went out birding at Montrose on Tuesday and asked a whole lot of other people. And there were birds everywhere. Um, First of year, you know, birds we hadn't seen yet in 2021 that showed up. I think I saw 15 species of warblers. I had seen two in all of April, and suddenly I got 15 in one day. That's the magic of migration. That's the power of it, and that's the draw for us birders. It's just this limited window where you can go out and hit the jackpot for a day where the day before was kind of dead, and maybe the day after will be kind of dead. You never know if it's going to be a good long run or whether it's going to be little fits and spurts. So watching the weather, watching the radar, watching the birds in their yard are all ways to kind of get your finger on that pulse and rearrange your own schedule so you can go out and do some birding on those days when things are really rocking. When I pause there, Julie, you have any other um, questions or comments we can touch on for a sec? Um, I've been answering a couple of them in the chat. Someone asked about what makes a warbler a warbler and I answered it in the chat. <clears throat> it's basically a small bird that eats insects and has a warbling song. Um, there were some other questions about types of bird seed and stuff, but I think you may be addressing that in a later slide. Yeah, I'll talk about feeders at the end. Um, I think feeders are a good topic, but I don't, I don't think they're central to this. Most of what I'm talking about are birds that probably wouldn't even come to a feeder. Um, Feeders are great. I have feeders. I have lured some very nice birds and I just enjoy watching the, the finches and the sparrows and the starlings and whatnot on them anyway. But um, when we have these hundreds of species of migrants coming through Chicago, many of these are not birds that would come to a feeder. And that was kind of the thing I didn't get as a kid. You know, we, we were bird people. We loved birds and we were aware of birds and we had feeders. But all we really did was watch those feeders. I, as I've learned more bird calls now, I can remember walking to the school bus when I was eight and nine years old and hearing sounds and not really wondering what it was. I was just like, oh, the birds are chirping. I now know I was hearing Blackburnian warbler and Eastern Phoebe and least flycatcher and all these cool birds that migrate north and south every year, but would never come to a feeder. 
so I don't want to dismiss feeders. Uh, I do have a slide on them and I will give you some bullets and, and some thoughts on them. And in fact, going into types of seed and where to get it. But let's hold that thought. That's at the end of the deck. Okay, and someone did ask about <clears throat> whether global warming has affect migration patterns. Yeah, I think that's still unfolding. I think we're in the early stages of that, but certainly there are people studying that. Uh, one thing I'm going to talk about tonight is eBird. eBird is a, a free website and it's a free phone app that you can put on your smartphone to report your bird sightings and people do it all over the world. It's really become a big thing in the last 15, 20 years. There are millions of people entering their bird sightings and then behind that they have very powerful computing, uh, you know, artificial intelligence programs running and analyzing it. And so what they're doing is through people's reported sightings, they can notice like, hey, a certain species is migrating earlier or migrating later, or it's not going where it used to go. They, there's been some amazing visualizations of bird migration just based on data in, entered into things like eBird. And absolutely, I think that uh, global warming climate change is going to have a huge impact on birds. There are conservation groups who study this stuff and they have their eyes on certain species that they think will be likely to be first impacted. I can't, yeah tell you, I could dive into the details on that right now. That's a fairly advanced topic. But if you start Googling that, you know, impact of climate change or global warming on birds, you will find some great articles and you will find certain species that are probably known to be on the leading edge of the risk because birds are very habitat specific. Um, so we were talking about a new, what kind of tree to put in our yard. We have a spot we want to put a tree and somebody said the projections are that in 50 years chicago will have the climate that alabama currently has and think about that first of all uh, but second of all we thought hmm, maybe we should find a tree species that could survive the winters we have now but won't get killed when the climate does warm and winters become more mild and we suddenly have these blazing hot humid summers even more so than we do already if that projection turns out to be right that's all fun and games for a gardener trying to plant a yard, but imagine being a bird that needs a specific habitat to breed in, and that habitat is going to change. There are plants that might not survive as a uh, warm climate pushes north into what used to be a cold place or vice versa. So, yeah, that's a great question. It's a complex topic. Keep your eye and ear out there. Probably, you know, Illinois Ornithological Society particularly, they do some very advanced topic presentations like this. They had a guy on the other day who is part of the group that runs the um, weather radar that monitors birds, and he talked about how that works and how they use it, all, all the computing power behind the data analysis they do. And those guys, you know, another 10, 20, 30 years of analyzing their data and watching how things change year to year, they will have concrete answers to that question as it unfolds. Anything else you want to hit on or should I keep rolling? I think you can keep going. Um, we have some sort of general questions I think that we can hold till the end. Okay. All right. Well, here we are. I mean, this is really where it starts for me. Uh, this is why you're all here. And again, thank you for coming. It's really nice that uh, you all took some time out of your schedule to join us for this. So how can you become a bird watcher? I really, I'm going to focus for the next little while here on some tactical things that are not going to be too daunting. They're not going to be too complicated. They're going to be fun. They're going to be easy to do. And I'm just going to really try to lay out some steps that uh, you can embrace to get yourself further into birding and decide that you want to be a birder. And really, it starts with that. Uh, like I said, I've always been watching birds my whole life. So in a way, I've always been a birder. So if you're looking at them, you're a birder. Doesn't mean you have to know everything. Doesn't mean you have to be able to identify everything you see. But if you're bird aware, if you're one of those people who looks out the window and sees something whiz by and goes, what was that? You are on the path to being a bird watcher. And the cool thing is once you decide to do that, instead of doing it absentmindedly like most of us do, once you say, hey, what was that? I want to I wanna know what I just saw. You're going to quickly find out you probably know more than you think you do. There's a lot of local birds you see all the time and you hear them all the time. And you might not even be thinking about it. But once you start to focus on that, you will quickly narrow down a bunch of your kind of regular suspects that are here all the time. And the fun with that is you will quickly get past them and start finding and seeing and hearing birds that you didn't know were there. And the way to do that is to ABB. Always be birding. Alyssa and I, we have a joke. Uh, my wife, you know, our friends, they're not, you know, many of them aren't bird people and they just 
marvel at how many birds we see and how many bird pictures we take and whatnot. And they say, how are you guys doing that? What, how does that happen? And we say, hey, BB, always be birding. And it's kind of a joke, but it really is no joke. Um, I am always birding in a way, even when I'm half asleep in bed. This morning was one of those. I was lying there going, what am I hearing? There were all kinds of birds calling. The robins are mating here. The cardinals are mating here. The gray cat bird just show up. He was making noise in the morning. I was lying in bed identifying bird calls or in some cases hearing things I couldn't identify. But I'm thinking, it's still dark out. I'm not even out of bed and I'm sitting here birding. That's how you do it. And then as soon as you get up, you go check the feeders. And then you make coffee, a cup of coffee and sit on the front porch and see what's scratching around in the yard. Um, I have been birding at work. You know, I've seen great birds out the office window. I've seen great birds in the car. See things fly over. You see hawks on a pole. You could be waiting for a doctor's appointment and they got some trees or a garden out there. You can see birds there. You really can bird more than you think you can. You can just about bird all day while you're doing other stuff, as long as you are near windows or outside, whether you're in a car or not. So some of it's just flipping a switch in your head to say, I'm going to start birding. I'm going to start caring about this. And then I want to start knowing about it more than I did before. And that's all you got to do. Just once you're on that path, you're rolling. And then your next step, you know, you can start to get focused. It's like any other discipline. Get yourself a bird book or get yourself a bird app. Or if you're like me and a lot of my birder friends do both. So I've got an app in my smartphone here called iBird Pro. I also have the free Audubon app. It's basically a full blown bird book complete with calls and, um, and range maps and really everything you need to know right in a simple to use app and it's free. Um, a book like this, this is probably the most widely held bird book among the people I know in Chicago. It's the Sibley Birds Eastern Region Guide. There are a ton of bird books out there. Any bird book you can get your hand on is going to have value. This is the one a lot of people gravitate to. They like the drawings. They like the text. They like the simplicity of the layout. Uh, as someone whose eyes are going a little in recent years, I will say my only gripe with this book is that the font is tiny. But... Um, you know, you can put on your readers and, and I do that and I can actually read it without my glasses, but it is a bit of a stretch and, and cruddy light. But if you want to get focused, get one of these and leave it around. You know, I, I just open the bird book and scan through it now and then I'm going to look at gulls today. I'm going to look at shorebirds. And then eventually I got obsessed with warblers, which really I'll talk more about warblers are one of the most exciting parts of migration. And you go by yourself this. Look at this thing. It's this giant tome about nothing but warblers. And we get about 36 species of warblers that come through Chicago every year. A book like this can help you really dive into that topic if you want. Fairly advanced topic. Don't run out and get this now if you can't tell a house sparrow from a starling. Uh, you'll get there. But once you start seeing warblers or even being able to recognize the common ones like a yellow rump, a book like this is an extremely exciting place to go. And the minute you start reading something like this and looking at whole pages of pictures that are nothing but What's the underside view of the tail of 12 different species of warblers look like? How are they each different so that if all you see is that little tail, you can actually make a guess at what you're seeing. You know, that's the kind of detail you can get into. And books like that will take you there. Whereas this is more about breaking birds into buckets, birds that might come to your feeder, come to your yard, birds that are going to be year-round residents versus migrants, etc. Shorebirds, gulls, raptors, owls. My, uh, you know, night jars, whippoorwills, all these little groups. There's, um, oh, one thing I wanted to say, I don't have it in the deck, but a lot of people don't know this, I find, my new birder friends. There's something in the neighborhood of 10,000 species of birds in the world. And there's something in the neighborhood of 750 or 800 in what's called the ABA area. So the American Birding Association has defined a region for the U.S., um, and they have made a list of expected birds in that species or in that range, birds that are known to live or pass through that region. And then anything that's not on that list is considered a rarity. So there are you know, ways to report rarities uh, through based on that ABA list. But the thing that's great to know is so you got about 10,000 ish birds worldwide. You got just a little bit, maybe under 800 in the U.S., we get the better part of 400 of them passing through Chicago. So half of the birds that are known to be seen in the country can be seen here. That's a lot of birds. I mean, pull over any random person on the street and say, how many birds did you see this week? Or how many birds can you name? You know, your average citizen is going to top out at five or 10. Your casual birder will get into the tens or twenties. And then your hardcore birder can rip off hundreds. But um, the exciting thing is when you're new, 
there's so much to discover. You're going to find quickly, you know, a good handful of local birds. And the minute you start filtering on those guys, you're going to start to see all the rest of it. And what you have to look forward to is the chance to see potentially over 300 birds pushing up against 400 here in Chicago. I haven't hit the 300 mark yet um, in Illinois. Um, I use eBird and I keep track of my sightings and I have built my list up a lot in recent years through birding more and through chasing interesting reported birds around the state and around the city more. Uh, but a lot of it starts with just getting into these books and figuring out, okay, I've seen this one, so what's his more obscure cousin I might see now and then? Or when did I miss ID? I actually thought I saw this guy, but I actually saw that guy. There's a ton of that to be had. And so studying a book or studying an app on your own and then keeping that stuff in mind when you're out birding is essential to getting on the path. And that's really a pretty simple thing to do. These books don't cost big bucks. And, um, and even if you don't get the book, there's free apps online. There's a website called All About Birds that Cornell runs. Killer, killer free resource. If you Google a bird name, 99 times out of 100, that All About Birds site will be the first result that comes back. You can immediately see the adult male, the adult female, the immatures. You can learn how they nest. You can hear their calls. You can see their range map. It's right there. I Google birds all the time. Even though I have those birds in my guide and my, my app, sometimes you're just at the computer and somebody will chat me up and ask a question about a bird and in seconds you can answer it. So if you could be bothered to do some research in any form, there's a lot of information that's at your fingertips that's going to help enrich your ability to find and identify birds. And I greatly encourage you to, to go for it. So on uh, that note, real quick, yeah, were, were the two birds in the previous slide an American <sighs> tree sparrow and a scarlet tanager? Yes, indeed. You're good. The okay. top one is the scarlet tanager. That's the reddest bird besides the cardinal that we ever see around here. Another one that only comes through spring and fall migration. Look at those black wings. They're un unmistakable when you see them. And they will be here any day, literally any day. Somebody saw one at Montrose this week. Um, the American tree sparrow is more of a winter bird for us. They're actually showing up as rare on reports right now, whereas a month ago, two months ago, they were common. I had tree sparrows in my yard this winter. They have that dot on the chest and the, notice the bill. See how the bottom half of the bill on that bird is yellow? That's a telltale ID point for American tree sparrow. There's um, upwards of about 20 kinds of sparrows we can see around here. And the way you start to be able to tell them apart is to look for those little things like that yellow lower mandible or that little dot on the chest. Sometimes you need a pair of those things. There are other sparrows that have a spot on the chest, but they don't have that lower yellow mandible. So that's how you tell your American tree sparrow from, say, a song sparrow, which also has a spot on his chest, but has some other stuff going on and doesn't have a bicolored bill like that. I was going to say we have had some people ask about how you identify birds and just a quick tip of my own for sparrows is the first thing you should look at is is the breast just a clear color or is it streaky because then you can divide them into or partially streaked so yeah, um, and, and actually, also my... don't don't forget that the library <laughs> has lots and lots of books we have field guides that you can check out so if you want to see if you like the sibley guide we have several copies of it, and we currently have books on display, at least through the end of this week, um, of field guides and books about birds and birding. So keep the library in mind uh, also if you don't want to spend money. That is a great, great point. Thank you, Julie. Okay, and binoculars, actually... Scott. Binoculars. That was another question. You're just a mind reader. Well, and I actually have a slide on that last question too. I am going to give you a list of things to look for, how to how to start identifying birds, because there are a lot of things to look for. There's an amazing amount of detail in, in birds, and there are certain traits you can watch for, but we'll get into more detail on that in a minute for now. Let's talk about binoculars. Um, when I was a kid, you know, there was always binoculars around the house. They weren't particularly good binoculars. We didn't know that at the time. They were just the only binoculars we had, so we were happy to have them. Binoculars have come a long way, and for not a lot of money, you can get a very good pair of binoculars, um, and you can get used ones. Or you know, my advice is get any binoculars you can. And as soon as you're birding enough that you say, "I don't think these are very good," you're going to solve that problem and go get some better ones. But I myself, I bought my first fancy pair of binoculars during COVID. I have been running with with fairly inexpensive entry level binoculars for years. They're just fine. You don't have to go blow a ton of money on them. There's um, 
companies like uh, Celestron and Wingspan that make binoculars in the $100, $150 range that are really, really good. Um, binoculars are key. If you really want to get into birding, somehow, some way, get yourself some binoculars. You will find there are different sizes and shapes. I mean, even look at this picture. That's myself and my little nephew, Nolan. He's using a tiny little pair that aren't necessarily made for kids. Um, we leave those in the car. And if we see something on the road, we just pull over and yank those out of the glove box and use them. So they totally will work for an adult as well as a kid and they're very light you could keep those in a backpack or a purse whereas that big honking pair i'm carrying those are my old swift 10 by 50s they were big they're they were great for things like the hawk watch where i was monitoring birds half a mile away they're a bit of a load to carry around all day these are pretty good um and then most of the binoculars that i've bought you know whether you get a thousand dollar pair or a hundred dollar pair a lot of binoculars these days look like this binoculars are not wildly complicated they they move like this because everybody's eyes are a different width so the first thing you do when you put your binoculars up is you spread them until they are equal with your eyes that way you're seeing equally right out both tubes the other thing that a lot of people do when they first get them is they just ram their binoculars right into their eye sockets you know like this it's not really how you want to do it it's more of a gentle kind of put them up against your eyebrow and look out uh, you'll get a better view and it's less fatiguing if you're out birding for hours like I often am. You really don't want the binoculars touching you any more than they must. You don't have to press them hard to your brow. You certainly don't want to shove them into your eye socket. And really, they're very personal. Everybody's eyes are different. Uh, every binocular comes with these little cups that you can turn up or down. So put that in there close. So see, I have my cups raised right now, or I can put them down. That creates what's called eye relief. Different people's eyes behave differently or like different amounts of eye relief. Also, if you're wearing glasses, some people like to put these cups up. They find they can see better up against a pair of glasses. Uh, others, not so much. It's very personal. My encouragement is to just mess with them. Just learn that you can spread the distance for your eyes. That's pretty easy to get right. You can play around with these cups to your heart's content with or without glasses. Sometimes I look through my glasses. Sometimes I look through my sunglasses. Sometimes I don't use glasses at all. I'm kind of constantly adjusting my binoculars around that. And, um, and the big one is this focus knob in the middle. It was funny. I was out birding the other day. I, I led a walk and there was somebody who had clearly never handled binoculars in their life. They did, literally didn't even know there was a focus knob. So she was looking right at the bird we were trying to see, but she said, can you help me with these? And I said, yeah, do you know about the focus knob? And she was like, what's that do? And I said, turn that to the right until the bird comes into focus. And she was like, oh my God, there it is. And uh, it came blazing into view, you know, beautifully for her. And I said, you know, you have to manipulate that thing depending on how far you're looking. So if you have a bird 10 feet from you, you get in focus, suddenly there's a bird 100 feet from you, you have to adjust that focus knob. So you're kind of constantly riding that. The other settings, this guy, and these cups, generally when you're out and about, you can sort of set those and forget them, but you're gonna constantly ride this focus knob. And the best thing to do is just practice with them. Sit out in your yard, you don't even have to have birds. Try to read license plates of cars whizzing by, look at mailboxes, look at trees, practice. Try to go quickly and say, I'm gonna look at my bird bath that's 20 feet away, and then I'm gonna look at my neighbor's antenna, which is 100 yards away, and then train yourself to swing back and forth because the binoculars are powerful. If you operate them well, which just takes time and practice, they're extremely powerful. And your eyes are also extremely powerful. It's something I want to tell people. I, I feel like I've, I've been observing a lot of new birders in the last couple of years since I've been leading walks. I don't think a lot of people know just how powerful their eyes are. Your eyes can focus very quickly on something very close to you or something very far from you. And you can go up and down and side to side and on angles really freely. I mean, even if you don't have 20-20 vision, which I certainly don't. I, wear, I have glasses. I wear them when I'm at my computer working and reading. But um, if your eyes are functional to get you through day-to-day -day life, your eyes are a super powerful tool for your birding. And a big part of it is sort of training your mind to just scan the heck out of an environment. Scan it in 3D. Scan everything between here. Like I'm looking out at my neighbor's house and there's some trees between us, which are great birding trees. I am used to looking at the branch that's closest to me and then looking right up that branch all the way into it and then seeing the trunk of the tree and looking down that trunk and looking at the branches that go out past it. So you're adjusting your depth of field 
constantly. Because a lot of the birds you're looking for, especially in the spring, the warblers, they're tiny and they're fast moving. And in many cases, they're nabbing insects off the bottom of leaves. They look like leaves themselves. Like with your naked eye, maybe all you'll see is the motion. So a lot of times I'm scanning naked eye, but I'm scanning in and out and up and down and back and forth and this and that way. I'm not just looking out sort of flat and seeing what's out there. I'm continually, you know, you're almost like the, if everybody saw the movie, The Terminator, where that guy just had this digital eye that could zoom in on things. You kind of got to put that in your head that you have that power. That plus these will make you very dangerous. You will see everything. So your first task is just to kind of learn to see anything that moves. Your next task is figure out where is it in that tree and then get your bins on it. And there is a Jedi mind trick that all the good birders know that I'm, I'm slowly developing myself over the years where if you can see a bird up in the tree, you can just put your binoculars up and be on it. You will have to adjust your focus depending on how far away it is and what the last thing you were looking at was. But you'll notice when you're out with really good birders, they'll go, oh, there's something up there. Boom. And in under a second, they're on the bird and they can see it, at which point you can start saying, it has a white ring around its eye. The wings are blue. It has pink legs. You know, you can pull all this amazing detail out. So don't think it's just the binoculars. It really, it starts with your eyes and your ears. I'm going to talk about ear birding in a minute. But uh, the combination of the power of your eyes and thinking of yourself almost like a camera lens, being aware of depth of field and not just looking straight ahead, but looking very carefully at everything. You know, when I scan my yard, I'm just out there almost like a computer, just, just scanning through everything to find that one little bit of motion. And you'd be amazed. Hey, it's kind of fun. You forget what you're doing. You can lose yourself, which for me is where it's at. I don't want to be thinking about work and the bills and what I'm cooking for dinner. I want to be out there scanning the heck out of my yard and find that one special bird that wasn't there yesterday. And uh, really letting your eyes do their thing, letting them run and training your brain to, to run them hard and then put these up to augment them once you find something. That's how you really get going. And, you know, I, I heard some people on the walk I led last week. They just somebody was shocked at the birds that myself and the other guide were finding. And we weren't doing anything special. I don't think we found anything hard or anything unusual for us, but they were just new. And it was a good reminder to me that people don't know what's possible. And what is possible is an awful lot once you dial yourself in and start thinking about it and using a tool like a pair of binoculars, even, uh, you know, not a terribly fancy, inexpensive pair, which uh, everybody should run out and get if you don't have one yet and you want to get going as a birder. So here's a very, very specific tactic that I've had great response from. A lot of my friends that I helped bird and Julie, you know, I love that Julie works at the library and invited me to do this because she came to one of my presentations and I think she would attest to the fact that this is a simple tactic here. Learn your regular birds. There are a whole bunch of birds I've got listed here. House Sparrow, House Finch, American Robin, Northern Cardinal, European Starling, Morning Dove, birds like that. Most of you know those birds, whether you think about it or not. So as you go out of the house tomorrow, when you see those birds, name them to yourself, name them in your head. That's a House Sparrow. Then start to get granular. That's the male, that's the female. They look a little different. Go look it up in your book or look it up online if you're not sure. Likewise, house finches, those little red guys, ton of them around. Robins, the robin redbreast, iconic American bird. They breed in Chicago. If you ever can't sleep at three or four in the morning and you're wishing the birds would quiet down, it's probably the robins out there doing their thing. They're very noisy at night. Um, cardinals, you know, your, your beautiful red bird. The upper left here is a female cardinal. They get a uh, they don't get quite as much tension as the males, which are all red. For my money, the females are actually the more beautiful one. I mean, look at that bird. That's in the fall when she's a little duller from her. They get fancier in the spring for breeding plumage, and then they quiet down with their colors a little in the fall. And um, the bottom line is, you know those birds. There's at least six, eight, ten that probably all of you on this call know, and some of you surely know more. Your task is just to leave the house, see them, name them. And what that will immediately trigger you into doing is noticing the other stuff. You'll see something that you'll suddenly go, that is not one of these ones I know. What is it? You know, start to observe what it's doing. Make some note of its physical traits. And I'll give you tips for that in a minute. But it's really that simple. And I have seen it in action. I've seen friends who said, okay, I'm going to care about birds now. And I know my cardinal and my robin and my house bears and my house finch and my gulls and well, some of the gulls, gulls are tricky, but morning doves, pigeons, we all see those every day. There's, there's no way you can move around in the Chicago area and not see those birds. 
So start with them. And then all you need to do is start noticing the other stuff. You don't have to know what it is. You don't have to be able to identify them on day one. It just gets you on the path of getting curious about them and getting fascinated and mostly just filtering. It's a lot of filtering. You know, at this point, I don't ever need to see another house sparrow again. I have nothing against them, but they are ubiquitous. There are millions of them. You can't leave the house and not see them. So I learned to kind of look past them just, dis you know, almost dismissively because I want to see that migrant bird that maybe behaves a little bit like them or looks a little bit like them, but isn't them and is only going to be here for a few weeks at a time. So it's a lot about filtering. And then another thing is, you know, right now, Julie timed this presentation perfectly. Spring migration is about to crack open. It did crack open this week. The first little window opened on Tuesday when those south winds kicked up overnight and all of a sudden all these birds rolled into Chicago. So as you become migration aware and remind yourself that April and May and September, October, partic you know, not always, but most years, those are the peak months to bird. That's when you have the most opportunity to see birds that wouldn't be here otherwise. Once you get that in your head, you can make plans around that. You know, I bird all year round, but I bird my butt off in these in, in this time of year. May May for me is all about birding. I don't do much else if I don't have to. I've got a job. I've got other obligations in life, and I tend to them as well I can. But uh, birding becomes the priority. And if you want to get into it and you want to go get schooled in warblers, for instance, show up at, at a place like Montrose or Labaw Woods or something on the right day, and there will be birds everywhere. And if you go to a popular park, there will be birders everywhere who will help you and show you stuff. Don't be shy to say to people, hey, I'm new. What's that? Can you give me a tip? And uh, almost everybody will. You know, it's like anything else. Not everybody's super friendly or giving, but most of the birders in Chicago, uh, very happy to share. They love sharing. You know, big part, I love finding birds on my own, but there's nothing better than finding a good bird and then getting your friend on it. Some people that have been coming to my walks uh, that I've been leading in one of the parks were at Montrose today, and I got them on a pretty rare bird, a thing called a yellow-throated warbler. It's a bird I've only seen like three times in Chicago ever, and I went out of my way to go find one down there today with the help of a friend, showed it to them, and, you know, it's COVID. We're not hugging, but if, we were, if we'd been in an era where people were hugging, we'd been hugging. Everybody was happy. Uh, this other bird on here underneath this cardinal, that is a black-throated green warbler. Not particularly green, certainly has a black throat. To me, it looks more of like a mustard yellow. Why it's named a black throated green has always been a bit of a mystery. You will find some birds have slightly misleading names. Uh, Connecticut warbler, for instance. It's not really a Connecticut bird. It was discovered there, but doesn't live there. So anyway, get to know your locals. Once you start to filter on them, you will inevitably notice other birds, and then you are officially on the path. You're going to be pulling that book out. You're going to be asking other people what you're seeing, and you're going to figure out an awful lot. And you can you can ramp up quickly. That's the fun thing. I mean, Julie, can you talk about that for a second? Before you came to my presentation three years ago, fast forward a year or two, how did your birding awareness change? Uh, well, um, I want to be a little cognizant of time, but I did... Um, for me, the best way that I learned birds was because I started ABB, always birding. And then also I used eBird to record and the birds that I saw. And then by studying eBird, which also links to Merlin, which is another Cornell app that helps you ID birds. That's the best way that I learned for IDing birds. And I also, bought a used camera with a zoom lens. So I would take pictures and then I could sort of study them up close because sometimes you can't see the bird really well. So if you can take a picture, um, you know, I just bought a used camera on Amazon and that helps me get a closer look at the bird and then I can compare it to a book or to Merlin or whatever. So, but I, I'm obsessed now, <laughs> so be she careful, is. but it's, it's awesome. really, really fun. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, one of the things I like to say, but I don't want to make daunting is there's an enormous amount to know. It, it, you, you'll be shocked how much detail there is, which I find awesome. I've been at it a long time. I have friends who think I'm like the bird guy. In truth, I'm just a bird guy in the making. I know the bird guy. He knows a lot more than I know. He can hear things I can't hear. He can see things I can see. He can predict things I wouldn't even know were possible. But I'm getting there, and we're all on the path in our own way, which is the cool thing. So for me, I like to cook and I like to play music. I've been playing instruments and cooking since I was a kid. Birding for me is, it ticks all the same boxes. 
Um, it's hard at first. It's frustrating. You feel like you're going nowhere for a little while, you know, kind of like you have to build up calluses for playing guitar or even for cooking. You know, I'm to the point now I hardly ever burn myself because my I've been burned so many times and my hand doesn't even care. You sort of develop those same burning muscles. Um, but uh, the key is to take the long view, you know, start small, start with the basics, practice as much as you can. In this case, practicing is not tedious at all. You don't have to sit there and play a G scale on your violin out of tune, driving your parents crazy all day. You just have to go out and watch birds bopping around in your yard or go down to the park or down to the beach or anywhere and just start looking at the birds, filter on your basics that you know, start to notice the others, slowly figure out what they are. One simple tip is to understand that birds, kind of like people, uh, don't all look the same. An adult male and female black-throated blue warbler, for instance, which is on the pictures here, look at those two. They look almost nothing alike on quick glance. I've seen them enough now. I can see the similarity. You know, if you took that dark black off that male and, and made it that grayish blue, suddenly they'd look a lot alike. But on quick inspection, you tell a new birder those, are, those birds are related or that they're a mating couple, they might not believe you. Also, see that little tiny white notch on the female's wing, the bottom bird? He has it too. You can sort of see it on his left wing. It doesn't jump out in this picture, but that is an ID point for that species, that tiny little thing. All you need to know, if you see a little green, greenish grayish warbler with a little bit of a line over its eye and that tiny little notch on its wing, that's how you identify a female black-throated blue warbler. It's a fairly advanced bird. You're not gonna see a ton of those, but once you do see it once, you'll never miss it again because all you need is that little eye line and that little notch on the wing. Very subtle little thing. And if you're considering season and habitat and behavior, those are your three big things to keep in mind. There are certain birds you're not going to see in Chicago in the dead of winter or in the peak of summer. Uh, over time, as you read your book more and you bird more and you look at eBird to see who's seeing what, you're going to learn the patterns. And... From that, you start to think about habitat. There are certain birds that I'm not going to see running around on the beach, but I might see scuffing around in the leaves in my garden or vice versa. You know, shorebirds. I live four blocks from the beach. I've seen 20 species of shorebirds out at the beach. Not one of them has ever come in my yard, and almost none of them has ever been seen flying over my yard. And yet, you know, it's a five-minute walk to get down there, and I can go find them. And, and we're here in the city. So even here, habitat is a factor. So just... Be cognizant of that when you're going out. Where am I birding? What time of year is it? And over time, as you filter everything on that, again, you'll start to bucket it all. You know, the 350 or 400 species of birds that come through Chicago aren't all here at once. They're not all doing the same thing at once, um, which is good in a way because it narrows down what you're likely to see. Uh, and a simple piece of advice, I mentioned it earlier, but there are lots of bird walks out there. There are some standing weekly ones. There's ones that are done Chicago Ornithological Society is always running a series of them. They publish a list. Their membership is very cheap, you know, 10, 15, 20 bucks. You can get family membership in these groups. I highly recommend doing that and going on birders with experience or bird walks with experienced birders because they'll not only show you birds you might not find, they'll help you identify them, but they're going to teach you skills for, for just becoming a better birder yourself, often just by leading by example. They're not going to be sitting there wagging their finger at you, telling you what to do. You're just going to observe them doing what they do. And you're going to say, oh, that's how you do that. And a lot of it has to do with that, just assiduous scanning. Just look for anything that moves. And look for shapes, too. You know, most birds are kind of round or raptors are upright. You can scan a gigantic tree and maybe just see one little shape that doesn't match in there. That's a way to get onto a bird. You know, put your binoculars on that guy. But I've, you know, I scan my neighbor's trees that are, God, probably 120, 150 feet from me. Earlier today, I saw some tiny birds bopping around in the sun way up high. Couldn't tell you what they were, naked eye, but I saw them, and I could be bothered to put my binoculars on them and quickly figured out there was a ruby-crowned kinglet, a house finch, and two house sparrows up there. Nothing wild. I was hoping for something more exotic, but it started with me just seeing that tiny little blob moving around high in a tree through that absent-minded scanning that, at this point, I'm just constantly doing because I care to. Uh, and then really, you know, that, that last bit there, I can't emphasize this enough. Do what feels right to you. There's no single way to do this. Uh, I know so many birders, and they're all different in their own way. Different people gravitate to different stuff. Julie's husband, Matt, he loves ducks. He got hooked on ducks. Ducks, for me, came later. I was, I was, I was like mallards, and then 
oh, it's not a mallard. I didn't really care for years. I just sort of skipped ducks for decades. And now I'm kind of sorry because we get a lot of cool ducks around here. You get your mergansers and your scoters and your golden eyes and your buffle heads. There's this crazy brew of them. And I dig them now. But for years, I didn't really care. I was interested in other stuff. And that's just as well because if you try to dig into all of them at once, it might be a little mind-blowing. So follow your own nose. Do what feels right to you. And don't worry if you see other people who are doing it a different way that you don't understand or you don't get, because that's their way and you get your way. All right, somebody asked this before. This is some real tactical stuff for how to identify a bird. So think of yourself, you know, you're probably not gonna have a clipboard, but picture as if you had a clipboard. You've got a mental clipboard. Immediately look at color. What color or colors stand out the most? A lot of birds only have one or two primary colors, especially these two here, that top is an eastern meadowlark. See that yellow on that face and that yellow on that throat and then that beautiful kind of woody, almost furniture tone on the back. That plus that black eye line. If you walked up to an experienced birder and said, I saw kind of a biggish bird on the ground with a pointy bill and yellow on the face and throat and a, a pretty wood colored back feather pattern, they'd say, oh, it's an eastern meadowlark. There's not a lot of other birds that fit that description. Likewise, this one under it, that's a fox sparrow. We only get them during migration. They've already come through. I'm not even seeing them now. We had fox sparrows in our yard in late March, I think, and, uh, and into April. They're very gray on the head, very rusty on the back. That little marking on their chest is called a chevron, that little zip, zip, um, the chevron gas logo. So look at, you know, make note of what the streaks look like. As you learn more birds, a lot of birds have chest patterns. And you want to, like Julie said earlier, you want to notice, is that breast plain or is it marked up? If it's marked up, how is it marked up? This guy has that big blobby spot high on the chest and then the little chevrons. If you said, I saw a rusty sparrowish bird on the ground with a grayish head, again, a good birder, an advanced birder would probably go fox sparrow. Uh, and once you see that fox sparrow, he's going to be burned into your head. You know what they look like. And that's one I always look for. They're an early migrant. They're a sign that migration's kicking up. They also love to scuff around in leaves and garden beds. So setting and behavior over and above the markings are helpful to ID it. That's not a bird you're likely to see hitting a feeder uh, or perching on a light pole at a big intersection. There's another thing, uh, eye, eye rings and wing bars. So the metal lark has a bit of an eye ring. You see that white outer ring around its eye? And in truth, the fox sparrow kind of has one too. Neither of those birds has what I'd call a pronounced eye ring. There are some birds that have super pronounced white rings around their eyes. That can help you narrow down a species. There are certain species where two might look very similar, but one's got the eye ring, one doesn't. That's particularly um, the case with thrushes, which thrushes are going to be coming through here. Some do, some don't. If you see an eye ring, you've immediately eliminated some possibilities for what that bird might be. Likewise, wing bars. I'll see if I can call out a bird on my pictures going forward. Wing bars are basically just stripes on the wings. So a lot of birds have a bar or two bars on the wings, and a lot of birds don't. Again, basic thing to look for to help narrow down what something might be, or more importantly, what it might not be. A lot of times you're just doing process of elimination. If you could say no eye ring and no wing bars, you've just knocked 25 sparrows or, or warblers off the list of what you might be seeing. Likewise with the, the bill and the leg. Remember I talked earlier about the tree sparrow. Got the yellow lower mandible and the dark top. Very tree sparrow. Most other sparrows don't really have that, although this fox sparrow is kind of rocking that look. Notice how his bill's dark on the top and light on the bottom. So look at that stuff and look at the legs. Do the legs look long or short compared to the bird? Can you detect a color on them? And what's the bird doing? Where is it? Is it on the ground or in a tree? And did you hear it sing? If so, can you even imitate the song or, or what did it invoke for you? These are all just loose things, loose information you should try to gather. And at first it can seem daunting, it's a lot but grab whatever you can and then talk to other birders and try to describe birds. And you'll be amazed how fast you get better at gathering that info and then making sense of it. And with these apps, some of these, you know, with Merlin and, and maybe even with the uh, iBird app, a lot of them, you can go in and say, I'm in Chicago, it's the middle of May. I saw a little brown bird on the ground that had a white eye ring, two wing bars and pink legs. And this thing will make suggestions for what you might see. So if you're into that kind of tool, you can actually, if you gather that information, you can use software or, or in many cases, free apps to go pull IDs off that information gathering you do. And then as you, you know, start to read your book more 
and study up and decide you're interested in certain bird species, you'll know this guy does or doesn't have a white eye ring. This guy does or doesn't have a gray nape. You'll hear there's a lot of bird terminology and the Sibley's and the other guides break it down. Really good birders know the name of every little body part and a little, every little attribute of a bird. And there's tons of them. I'm still learning them. I know a lot of them, but I don't know all of them. You hear words like supercilium and nape and undertail coverts and there's this whole vocabulary and it's fun i'm completely into it now for a while i was like oh that's just too much um but then once i started seeing birds and describing them and figuring out like the thing that made that unique even a gray cat bird he was in our yard this week it's the plainest looking gray bird with a little black cap almost nothing to describe it other than medium-sized gray bird like not quite as big as a robin but bigger than a sparrow but it has a cinnamon colored undertail covert. So this little patch down by its butt, down by its rump under the tail. When that guy jumped up onto my fence, I could suddenly see that blazing little bit of cinnamon there. It's beautiful. So every time I see a cat bird now, I kind of look at it until I see the little bit of cinnamon because that's his defining feature. That's the thing you know, you absolutely got a cat bird if you see that. And most species have something like that. So those are, just One. some ways to give yourself a checklist and just train yourself to do some kind of information gathering, put it into whatever terms you can. What did yeah, you say? Also, Joel? I just wanted to add also just consider the size. You know, if it's if it's tiny, you know, it's not going to be a heron. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. That's a good one, but size is also tricky. Size can be hard yes. to judge, especially with things like hawks. People will say, "Oh, it's huge." But if it's the only hawk you're looking at, it looks huge because hawks are bigger than robins and cardinals, but if you're looking at a Cooper's hawk and suddenly a bald eagle flies in, you're going to say, oh, it's not huge at all. It's puny. It's huge in the scene here. Um, size is also very hard to gauge in photos. I'm on a lot of bird forms where people are like, look how giant this bird is. And somebody's like, that's a seven inch bird. It's not huge. Um, so if birds can look big in their environment, depending on where they are. And also in the binoculars, like when I see warblers, they look dinky, you know, they look like an egg with legs and wings. Then you put your binoculars on them, you get them full frame and nice light in the sun. Suddenly the thing looks gigantic because you're seeing all the detail on it, even though it's this little thing. So size is something to be aware of. It's best to compare birds. So if you can see three or five species at once, look at them relative to one another. Don't just look at a bird and judge it large or small. Judge it large or small in relation to the other birds you can see it near because it can be deceiving. Um, we've been talking about warblers and migration and listening while you look. These two birds in the pictures here are perfect examples for that. You've got a yellow warbler up on the top. That's one of the more common warblers we'll see a lot of here in the next few weeks. See that red streaking on that breast? And that bird is yellow overall with those kind of brownish olive wings and that very black eye without much of an eye ring. Classic yellow warbler. I saw a couple at Montrose today. Underneath that, much more elaborate bird, much more eye-catching, much harder to find. That's a black Bernian warbler. We get a few of those every spring and fall. That's one I go out and look for and look for and look for until I find it. Like, I'm not happy if I don't see a black Bernian every spring. And the reason for that, the reason I'm obsessed with that bird is because the first time I ever found one on my own, I heard it before I saw it. I was in my house and suddenly I heard this crazy multi-note, ascending and descending, high-pitched thing going on. And I said, what the heck is that? I had no idea what it was. I had a feeling it was a warbler because they're famous for their kind of complex calls and very high pitched calls, but I wasn't even attempting to make a guess at what it was. I just knew I had to go outside and find what was ever making that sound. And I found this guy and I took that picture. That's in the um, tree in front of our old house in Logan Square, 15 feet from my front door. And uh, that remains one of my favorite birds because of that experience. I had never really seen it well before. I didn't know its call. Through a window, I heard something strange and foreign, wa wandered around outside until I stumbled on this guy, and he was giving me an amazingly good look. And as you can see, he was singing. So I got to see him sing his song while I was photographing him and observing him through my binoculars. That is how you burn birds into your brain. That guy and I were going the distance. I will never not know Black Bernie and Warbler again. Um, that was a completely mysterious and exotic bird that frankly I thought I'd probably never see or find and then suddenly I had that connection day with it and um, it hinged off the song so bird song is complicated I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie it's not easy I don't think I'm very good at it I'm getting there all but the easy thing to do much like with my visual tip earlier 
focus on your locals, your Cardinals, your Robins, your Sparrows, the birds that are always here, learn them. Then you just start filtering. You can find the stuff that isn't them. Same with the calls. You know the calls of those other birds. You hear morning doves and pigeons and robins and cardinals and house sparrows and starlings going off every day, whether you're thinking about it or not. Hopefully starting tomorrow, a bunch of you are gonna be listening to those. You'll learn that day-to-day -day normal soundtrack. And all you have to do is listen for the thing that doesn't sound familiar. That's it. You don't have to make a guess at what it is. You don't even have to profess to make a guess. But you do have to go outside and grab your binoculars and listen and find whatever's making that sound. And if you're lucky enough to find it and gather some information about it, orange face, black mask, flecky sides, that plus maybe imitating its call. And suddenly, you know, I've got a Blackburnian warbler once you've got your book out and you're looking. So the ear birding, the really advanced birders I know, they bird more with their ears than they do with their eyes. They'll stand in a forest early in the morning and they'll just close their eyes and they'll listen and they'll inventory and they actually can get selective. I was out with my friend, Steve, who's one of my birding mentors. He's an amazingly good birder, been birding his whole life at a high level, traveling all over the world. Uh, we stood in a forest one day and he named about 15 species he heard inside of 30 seconds. And we didn't have a lot of time. So he decided that the Northern Perula warbler would be the one we should put any time into. And so we immediately spent like 10 or 15 minutes listening for their calls, walking slowly, walking slowly, listening, walking, listening, walking, suddenly, boom, there it was. We found it and we jumped in the car and kept going. And uh, we had a busy day with a bunch of stops, but that was a bird we wanted to see. It's not an easy to find one, but it all started with him hearing its call. So that's a way to do it as a very advanced birder. But as a new birder, you can just stand out and just listen for the stuff you haven't heard before and try to find it. And that's how you become a better birder and a more experienced birder. And if you want to get tactical about it, get the app called LarkWire. I think it costs about 15 bucks. It's a smartphone app. I have been using it. It's a very simple game format. They just show you pictures of birds and they play you calls and they kind of train you and then they quiz you. It's an honor system. They actually will play back pictures and calls and you have to say whether uh, you know what it is. So it does trust you to, to say whether you're really being truthful about whether you were right or not. And as you get better, it gets harder, folds in more birds, more kinds of birds. And sometimes there are bird calls between very different types of birds, like a shorebird and a little warbler. Two birds you'd probably never see at once might actually have fairly similar voices. Um, so it'll play both of those to try to trick you. They're really good um, ear birders. And I know a lot of them have been hardcore users of LarkWire. They spend a half hour, an hour every night. They can be bothered Just put their headphones in. I do it in bed. If I can't sleep, I wake up in the middle of the night. I'll just bang on bird calls for a half hour, an hour. And uh, it's a fantastic tool. And it's fun. You know, if you're into music or uh, I don't think it matters if you're a musician. I'm a musician. I don't think I'm any better or worse at bird call ID by virtue of playing music, but it does train you to listen for is the pitch going up or down or how many beats was it? You know, a lot of calls are like, chuk, chuk, do, 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 do. so you'll say like, oh, three beats and then it went up and then it went down. That's there's ways to describe bird calls. And there's a lot of software and free apps and free websites out there to help you really dive into that if you want to go there. If you're looking to, to advance fast, getting into the call thing is a way to do it. Uh, I'll take a quick breath here, take a sip of water. Julie, any questions before I keep rolling? We're, we're closing in on the end of my deck and then we can just chat a little. Uh, yes, someone asked um, uh, where the weekly walks are, but I will include some information about that in the presentation. And uh, people were asking about kinds of bird seed. I apologize, I haven't gotten to the feeder thing yet. I sort of deliberately okay. put that at the end because I don't okay. want you to make the mistake I made, which is to just, when we were kids, to just fill the feeder and sit and stare at the feeder and miss all the other stuff. Um, the feeders are, are important. They are fun. They're, it's a great way to go, especially if you're birding from home. And I will get to that in a minute. Um, I do want to talk about where to go out and go birding. So if you're interested in going birding and like folks like Jackie and Chris who are on here, they've been coming to Westridge Nature Preserve, which is one of the ones that we can get too close to home in, here in Rogers Park. That's a nice spot to go. It's not huge, but they've really developed it nicely and they're getting some good birds. There's Scott, when, when are those walks? Um, I, I'm not prepared to throw that out. It's, it's on a schedule and there's a whole RSVP system and I think I might create chaos if I try to okay. do that. Um, 
the Westridge Nature Preserve Facebook page is the best place to get that info. Okay. Um, and we've been having huge turnouts to the point where we've almost had to be turn, turning people away too. COVID has complicated the bird walk thing. Hopefully with all of us starting to get vaccinated and COVID um, becoming a little less of a nightmare around here, we'll, the bird walks will open back up. But, you know, I've done bird walks where we've had 50 people show up and it's hard, you know, bird walk, the best bird walks are five or 10 people and a guide. Five per guide is generally regarded as good. So um, the bird walk thing has been a little tricky in the last few years, but COS and um, the other bird clubs are all navigating it quite well, doing as much as they can to accommodate groups and, and get people out. But Julie's handout, which is, I think will be a combination of things she gathered and some that I have, she will tell you a lot about that. But in the meantime, you know, there's places like Montrose, it's world famous. It's it's a huge migratory stopover. It sticks out into the lake. It's heavily birded. Sometimes there's too many birders there. It gets a little nutty. But I was there this afternoon and there was almost nobody there. And the birds were great. And I had a wonderful time. Uh, La Ba Woods over by the in between 90 and 94. Northwestern University right up the lakefront from where I am in Rogers Park. There's a place in Glenview called Air Station Prairie. Real neat place to bird. You can see some neat things in there like Virginia rail and woodcock and Sora, strange little marsh birds that you would never normally see out at, uh, say, a place like Montrose very much, which is more woodland or dune. Um, Skokie Lagoons is a big one. On the south side, Jackson Park is hugely birded. Northerly Island, Lake Calumet is a whole region with a ton of great birding to be had. There are The best thing you can do is just get on eBird. You don't have to be a, a, a technically savvy person to use eBird. It's kind of like the Google of birds. eBird's a free site. Even without registering and signing up, you can go peruse um, eBird. So you can actually just Google eBird Cook County and up will come a page where you will see a list of hotspots. You will see the top birders in Chicago, the people who report the most and report the most birds. You dig far enough in there, you might find Julie and me in there. Um, there are hotspots all over the place, and not just in Cook County. I realize some of you may not even be in Cook County. Um, Lake County, DuPage County, all the counties surrounding Chicago have just scads of places to go birds, many of which will have walks or have events. Um, Sorry, I oh, will I, be sending I, out a handout that includes places in Evanston where? specifically. Where? Maybe Gilson. Yeah, Gilson Park up on the North Shore here is another good one. Uh, local cemeteries. We live right near Calvary Cemetery in Rogers Park. I walk that with purpose several times a year. Sometimes there's nothing there, but sometimes you see great birds, especially during migration. Owls like to show up in cemeteries too. You might get lucky uh, cemetery with really old trees. Sometimes there's owls breeding in there. Uh, so cemeteries are a great place to go. But really, what I want to hammer in is that you can bird anywhere. You can bird literally on your block at the little park across from your block. You can bird along the train tracks. You, if you have access to the beach or the lakefront, there's birds everywhere, especially during migration. Birds show up in funny places. They're looking for places to rest. They're looking for places to feed. And in our case, we've got a yard with a bunch of native plants and shrubs and trees. If you've got that, you've got birds coming that you may not even realize. I, mean, I have documented... 114 species of birds from my yard that includes some flyovers that didn't touch down i've seen you know bald eagles and red-tailed hawks and whatnot but we're pushing up against 100 species that have actually been physically seen in the yard in a 50 by 150 foot urban lot i would have never believed that was possible when i moved here you know 25 30 years ago but it's absolutely possible and a lot of you on this call if you have any kind of yard at your disposal whether it's in an apartment building or a condo complex or your own uh, home where you live with a yard. Start scanning your yard. Get up early in the morning. Look for little things scraping around in the garden beds. Look for things lurking in the in the bushes and you'll find there's a lot of those regular expected birds but during those spring and fall migration months that's when the other stuff comes through and you, you might be shocked how much is coming through your yard that uh, you weren't previously aware of or might not have even thought was possible. Uh, these are some groups of birds to look at. So if you want to get focused, you know, again, follow your nose. Different things will appeal to different people. For me, it was raptors. When I was a kid, I started seeing hawks, and I just went crazy. I thought they were the coolest thing. Red-tailed hawks, Cooper's hawks, kestrels, peregrine falcons, etc. They are around. The Chicago area has a lot of raptors all year round. 
and um, they are out there to be seen. You'll often see them soaring or you'll see them on light poles. If you have a bird feeder or a bird bath, they might come into your yard and try to eat a small bird. So raptors are a fun group to dig into. Likewise, herons. If you get out to Skokie Lagoons or go paddling on the Chicago River, you will see herons, great blue herons. They are gigantic. You know, a lot of people mistake them for cranes. They're very crane-like. But they are a blue bird with a long neck, often seen on the edge of a body of water, throwing its head into the water to nab frogs or fish. Same with the black crown night heron. That's the one I mentioned earlier that I call the urban penguin. They are endangered in Illinois due to habitat loss, but they thrive in Chicago. They're uh, down by Lincoln Park Zoo. There's a big rookery. They nest in Skokie Lagoons. They nest along the Chicago River, as do green herons. They're a much littler guy. Um, but that's a fun bucket of birds like that. When I was new in Chicago, Alyssa and I used to go paddling and we would see all three species of herons in the same day. And it was very exciting to us. We had no idea that was possible. And now these are routine birds for me. I see them all the time. I love them. I don't, you know, I'm not dismissive of them, but I'm, neither am I surprised to be seeing them because there's lots of them during the warm months and they're really neat. Um, with spring migration coming, orioles, tanagers, and buntings are three Different buckets of birds, very colorful, Baltimore Oriole and Orchard Oriole. The Baltimore is the more common, iconic orange and black bird. That's the one I had on my first slide perched on my fence. Uh, tanagers, the scarlet tanager we showed you earlier, bright red, red bird with the black wings. And indigo buntings are this bright, just blazing blue little bird, you know, hardly bigger than a finch. But they will come through town and they might come to your feeder or they might perch in your yard or you might see or hear them out at a, out at a local park. So another kind of bucket of birds to look for. And then the two big buckets that once you get serious, you know, it took me a while to get into these, but once I decided I really cared about birding and I started going birding with purpose and hanging out with other birders during spring and fall migration, warblers and sparrows are just the greatest rabbit hole you can go down. There's about 36 possible warbler species that come through here. A handful of them are very hard to find. A bunch of them are pretty hard to find, and a bunch of them are really pretty easy to find once you kind of get dialed in, like yellow warbler and magnolia warbler, yellow rumped warbler, palm warbler. They're all over the place. They're, they're coming. They're out there now, and there will be more. And um, once you start to find them, you're going to probably get the bug if you're like me, and you're going to start chipping away at the others. How do I find these other ones? What do they look like? What do they sound like? Where do they go? When do they come? Um, and that's when I, you know, I went and bought this book and really started studying warblers. I'm not going to say you should hold off on getting into warblers. It is, it can be an advanced topic, but if you find you've got the aptitude for this and you're into it, warblers are probably the most popular type of birds among the birding community here in Chicago. Mostly because they're, they're not here all year round. It's very precious. There's this little window in which we can see them. So we get... You know, we're canceling plans. We get very excited to go find them because you know, as soon as they're here, they're gone. And you got to go another few months without them. And then they show up again in the fall and then they're gone again. So I absolutely have the warbler bug, as do a lot of my friends. And sparrows come right behind. I had no idea. I knew the house sparrow and I thought that was it. And then I one day I saw a sparrow with a little rusty cap and a line through its eye. It's a chipping sparrow. And it was actually going, chip, chip. It, was saying the, it was saying chip. It, it was like, oh, I just found a chipping sparrow. And I started looking at lists and guides and I realized, oh, there's a swamp sparrow and a savanna sparrow and a song sparrow and a fox sparrow and a Harris sparrow and all these other ones. And just like the warblers, some are easy to find, some are a little more exotic and some are really hard to find. You have to go to specific places at specific times to get them. But if I was to give everybody some advice on where to start, you know, pick, pick one or all of these buckets and start digging into them. As far as these pictures, that's a Cooper's hawk in the upper left. Took that on my block right by the house. These guys will hunt your bird feeder. If you have feeders out, they will come and try to take finches and sparrows off it. They eat birds for a living, and uh, it's all part of the natural cycle. And below that is an immature black crown night heron. That was taken at North Pond. If you want to see herons, go to North Pond in Lincoln Park. That's probably the most dependable place especially as the weather is warming up here. The uh, black crowns, the green herons, and the great blues can all be seen right there in North Pond by the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. And if you go down by Lincoln Park Zoo, there's a whole big heron rookery there for the black crowns where you can see tons of them. So lots of other birds, shorebirds, gulls, etc. Those can be a little harder. So start with some of these and that'll get you rolling. 
We talked about eBird. I'm not going to dwell on this a lot, but if you're interested at all in this, just go to eBird.org sometime soon and start poking around. Uh, you can register for free. You can create your own account. You can start reporting your bird sightings. Um, I hate doing data entry and I have like a chronic fear of filling out forms. It took me a long time to kind of get in a groove with eBird. I am over my phobias and I am eBirding like a crazy man now. I, I eBird almost everything I see. I made it my mission. I'm going to eBird my yard every day this year and then I'm going to print out a bar chart at the end of the year that shows every species I saw and when I saw it and which were the most frequent and which were the least frequent. The power of this site is incredible and you'll be a citizen science. It's all going to Cornell University. There are real ornithologists and scientists analyzing that data and doing modeling on it and making predictions about bird health and bird populations and climate change and all that stuff. So um, if you're of a mind to do that, uh, eBird is a great tool. It's not for everybody, but most of the birders I know, once you hit a certain level of seriousness, it's fun to keep track of your own sightings, but it's also a great way to just plan your bird. And you can literally go, hey, what did somebody see at the park near my house yesterday? And you can see that list, and then you can go out the next day and look for that bird. And I'll tell you, that system works. I have gone and found birds I've never seen before just off that simple system of noticing that somebody else reported a bird yesterday at a park near my, my house. And I went out, and sure enough, there it was. Uh, as far as these two birds on the page, that upper left is a Lacan sparrow. That's probably the most exotic bird that's ever showed up in our yard. That was last spring. Just an absolute mind blower. Um, had I been a less experienced bird who hadn't gotten as far into it as I had, I surely would have missed it or discounted it as a little brown bird. But being where I am in my progression as a birder, I knew immediately what it was when I saw it. You see how it's orange? There's only a couple sparrows that have that orangey tone. And I knew that that was a Lacan, and I immediately got my camera on it and followed it around for a half hour and took pictures and told friends and invited people to come over and see it. It's a huge day, one of my favorite sightings ever in Chicago. Underneath that, much more common bird. That's a common nighthawk. It's not actually a hawk. It's more like a big swallow or swift. They're not here yet, but you probably all have seen and heard them, whether you know it or not. They are a summertime in Chicago bird. They will fly around at dusk, and they make a very quacky kind of... <laughs> kind of call, and they eat insects on the wing. Uh, if you've ever been out of baseball, you know, if your kids play ball or something, anywhere where there's lights on over a field where the bugs all congregate, the nighthawks will swoop through there and feast. Uh, so they're another kind of iconic summertime Chicago bird. When you're out grilling on the backyard after work, you will inevitably see and hear nighthawks, and it's something that uh, most of us who've been at it a while start to look forward to. So here's my little summary slide. We're going to just bang out what we just talked about. Your mission, if you want to get into this and uh, you're here, so you must. Get a bird book. Get an app. Start studying them. Get binoculars. Start using them. Keep them out where you can see them. I got a couple pair of binoculars. I got some beaters I leave in the car. I got my old pair that's all knocked up but still works. I leave them in the living room window. I got my good pair that's ready to go anytime I leave the house. I take them with me. Seriously, I walk to the grocery store with binoculars uh, and or a little camera. And uh, you'd be amazed what you can see on that five-minute walk up to the Jewel. Your big task is get to know your local regulars. You know them already. You just need to start thinking about it a little bit maybe to dial down Cardinal, Morning Dove, Robin, etc. Once you catalog those guys, you're going to start noticing other birds and you're going to start figuring out what they are. Also, always remember to listen. You'd be amazed what your ears will tell you. You might not know what you're hearing. doesn't matter. You just need to hear something new. And then if uh, you can spend the time to find the bird that's making that sound, it's a great way to learn a new bird and learn a new bird call in the meantime. Spring and fall migration, that's really where it's at. That's the thing to be most aware of. You can and you should bird all year round in Chicago. There's always good birds to see here. But the peak of the whole thing and where the, the hardcore birders go the craziest and rearrange their lives to go birding is now. This next few weeks is going to blow up. Last year, it took till late May till the floodgate really opened. And then we had this week that was just insane. There were birds everywhere and birders everywhere. And it was so fun. And it happens every year. And you never know quite when it's going to happen. And maybe it rains on the day it happens. And you got to get wet to go out. Uh, there's all kinds of crazy factors. But... Uh, for me, my bird life changed when I became aware of spring and fall migration and, and understood what that meant and what that opened up as far as opportunities to see birds that you're never going to see in the dead of winter or in the peak of summer. And then go ahead and you know, join a local bird group, Chicago Ornithological Society, Chicago Audubon, Illinois, 
Ornithological, Illinois Audubon, North Shore Bird Club, those are a big five that I'd recommend you look at. They're all very inexpensive to join, practically free, amazing resources. You'll learn about walks, you'll learn about events, you'll get newsletters, and uh, that will immediately raise your game. I talked about eBird. Uh, social media is great too. Go on, fa if you use Facebook, uh, or even Instagram. There's a lot of birding groups out there. Illinois Birding Network is a big one. Uh, Chicago Ornithological Society and Chicago Audubon both have pages. People like me take pictures of birds around town and share them. And so to a degree they're photo sharing, but it's more about finding interesting birds or having cool stories about finding a hard bird or something you've never seen before. A term you're going to learn is lifer. The first time you see a bird in your life and you remember it, that's your lifer. Uh, I got my life for this rough, this strange Eurasian shorebird that showed up in Illinois the other day. You're always, as a birder, looking for lifers. And um, the social media is a great place to see people share their lifers and maybe give you tips on how you can go find your, your first look at a bird that you're interested in or been reading about. And uh, last but not least, always be birding, ABB. Just keep that in the back of your head. You know, it's kind of a joke, but it's, it's no joke. Uh, once you embrace that, if you want to get into it, as long as there's some kind of daylight, or even if there's not at night, you can hear birds, uh, songbirds not migrate at night. So I go out this time of year and sit out on quiet nights when there's south winds and listen. And sometimes you can hear cavalcades of tiny chirps flying over your house. That's migration happening. And when the sun comes up in the morning, those birds making those calls at night might be feeding in your backyard. So uh, ABB. Uh, Julie, I think we're tight on time. I'm going to skip the, the CBCM thing and the photography thing. I'm going to talk about feeders because people have been asking about this. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. All right. And also one quick question though. People said, what are the best times of day to go birding, AM or PM? Yeah. So in the spirit of uh, ABB and always be birding, my short answer to that is go birding whenever you can. Do not be constrained by the hour of the day. I have seen amazing birds literally at every hour of the day. But the conventional wisdom among birders is that first thing in the morning is best. Birds uh, get hungry. They aren't generally feeding at night, especially birds that eat insects and, um, and are foragers and aren't coming to feeders and whatnot. Those birds are usually resting or migrating at night. Soon as the sun's up, those birds want to eat. And um, so when I go out birding with my really hardcore buddies, we are out of the house before the sun is up and we are at our birding location when the sun comes up. And that first hour or two is usually where the real action happens. But that's not to say you can't see birds mid-morning or at lunchtime. There's usually a bit of a lull in the middle of the day, depending on what you're doing. I think that that noon to two or three can be kind of dead. But I was at Montrose today from noon to three and I saw some great birds. So... Morning is, again, the, the conventional bird wisdom, but really don't, don't ever let that hold you back. Bird when you can, especially, you know, if you work a nine to five job and you're busy with family stuff and, and other obligations on weekends, your window is limited. So squeeze in a half hour before work or squeeze in a half hour after work. You don't have to go birding for a long time. You know, a lot of, I do birding 15, 20 minutes at a shot and have my binoculars and or my camera at the ready. And I'm constantly pulling in new species and photographing things I've never seen before. It wasn't like I was out for 12 hours on a Saturday. I do do that as well. Uh, a couple weeks ago, my friend Steve, I met him at you know, 4.45 a.m. And we drove three hours and then birded for 12 hours and drove three hours home. So it's like an 18-hour day. It was awesome. We saw a ton of cool birds. I was wiped out the next day. I don't, I don't do that that much. But I know people who do that every weekend. What if you get crazy but yeah morning is good bird when you can otherwise as far as feeders you know feeders are not required there's a lot of people on the skull that probably can't have feeders depending on where you live if you live in a multi-unit building or an apartment building a place without a yard a place with a lot of close neighbors you might not even be able to do a bird feeder you have to be very mindful of the fact that birds are going to drop seeds on the ground birds are going to make their own droppings makes it inopportune to have feeders in some places. So some of you probably aren't candidates for feeders, but some of you might have a yard of your own or a shared yard with some other folks who would be open to it and you can do a feeder. Uh, I do feeders here. I didn't for years. I got my yard list up to 100 species without a feeder. Seriously, with the first four years we lived here, I don't think I hung a single feeder. Couple, last couple of years, I started putting them out just for fun and to try to attract some of the interesting migrants. And I've had some success with that, including this bird on the bottom left here. That's a pine siskin. 
that's a hard bird to find in Chicago. They only pass through some years. We don't get any of them. This year was a good year for them. Pine siskins have been coming to my feeder. The bird above that coming to that peanut feeder, that's a white-breasted nuthatch. They came around in the late fall, early winter for a while. Didn't see them regularly, just saw them a few times. Um, but you got to be aware that uh, you're, you're also in the city. There's rodents, you know, there's rats. Uh, at our old house in Logan, we put a bird feeder out. The house sparrows knocked all the seed on the ground. The pigeons came in and right behind that came the rats. We immediately pull, pulled the feeder. We didn't want rats in our yard and not, neither did our neighbors. So that wasn't good. Here where we are now, knock wood, there hasn't been much of a rat problem. You really do have to clean up. You got to rake or sweep under your feeder. Don't leave a lot of old seed holes or old wet seed down there. Like be clean, clean your feeders. Avian disease is very serious. Birds can transfer disease among their feeders. So I pull my feeders in, wash them in the sink, throw them in the dishwasher. And uh, you just, you know, it's like anything else. You just have to be on it if you're going to do it. You can also spend some money. Bird seed, there is a lot of cheap bird seed out of there. A lot of it's junk and it's full of filler. There's a place in Glenview that I go for my bird supplies called Wild Birds Unlimited. Great store. They have high quality product. They're very knowledgeable. They'll ask you about your yard. They'll ask you what kind of birds you want to draw. And um, really, I've got the, this fourth block here, fifth block here, thistle feeders. Great for finches. Um, not very messy. Niger thistle is very tiny little black seed and it's usually in a tall screen feeder. I've got house finches and gold finches on mine every day right this time of year. It's fun. It's easy. It's not messy. It's not cheap though. Niger thistle costs some money. Um, suet and nut feeders are great for bringing in woodpeckers. That's what I grew up on. My gramps made his own suet feeders and he would just go get chunks of fat from the butcher and ram them in there. Now they make engineered suet that's high, high protein, high fat for the birds. Um, so it's not terribly expensive, three or four or five bucks for a block and it'll last weeks. You don't want to do suet feeding during warm weather. Suet can rot, can spoil. Uh, in general, bird feeders typically come down for the peak summer months. There's plenty of natural food out there. So I'm going to pull my feeders at the end of May, most likely till about September. Right now, you want to do the simplest thing to attract a spectacular bird to your yard. Buy some oranges, cut them in half, and just stick them on fence posts. Or if you have those trees that hold plants, you know, those shepherd poles, I put oranges on the end of the shepherd pole hooks. Baltimore Orioles, Orchard Orioles, Scarlet Tanagers, um, Rose-Breasted Grosbeaks, Catbirds, great birds will come in and eat those oranges as they're migrating through in the next few weeks. That's an easy, cheap, and spectacular way to go. I have pictures of Orioles on my oranges that I have shown friends, and they just can't even believe that that happened in a Chicago backyard. Totally doable. Um, hummingbird feeders are really cool, too. We get ruby-throated hummingbirds here, and we get some other rarities. Um, another one, be, keep it very clean. Look up how to make your own nectar. It's simple. It's just sugar and water. You boil the water. You put in a certain amount of sugar. They do make a, a solution that Wild Birds Unlimited will sell you. Put a little dash of it in there to keep the stuff from spoiling and change it every week. Like don't leave it out there for days at a time. If you're going to feed birds, you want to be helping them, not hurting them. And uh, you just have to be mindful of that. And there's a ton of great info online. There are whole websites and community groups uh, on the internet about feeding birds. Uh, so explore those if you're really interested. But hopefully this is a helpful primer. So that is everything I had in my deck, uh, unless we want to talk about bird collision monitors and, and or photography, or if people just have questions. I know we're kind of at the end of our time. I'm happy to run a little long if people want to. What do you think we should do, Julie? Well, there start. was a question about whether apples attract uh, birds. You mentioned oranges. Someone asked about apples. I think if you have an apple tree, that certain birds will come and eat them. Birds love naturally occurring fruit. Uh, we deliberately put a service berry tree in our yard recently. It makes a tiny little berry, but it's famously popular with uh, cedar wax wings. Uh, I've never had experience with an apple tree myself. Um, I've never put apples out specifically for birds. I know the oranges are really the thing with the Orioles, and it's really just for a little window in May. Once summer gets rolling, um, there's other food supplies and they won't come to your oranges as much. People put grape jelly out, if you can believe that too. Just regular old grocery store grape jelly. Uh, Orioles love that. Sometimes I'll cut segments out of the orange and I'll fill them with grape jelly and they come in and just lap it up. 
Um, but yeah, sorry to not have a better answer on the apples. But again, Google is your friend. You be, I Google so much. My friends think I know everything about birds. Mostly they ask me questions and I'm over here just Googling their question. And then in two minutes, you can find five different answers to it and kind of assemble it and, and pick up your own knowledge along the way. So don't be shy of, you know, any idea you've got about birds. Just, just Google it. Can I see a northern mockingbird in Chicago? You know, 10 seconds, you're going to have your answer. And, and likewise with the feeders, what's best to draw this kind of bird or that kind of bird? It's all right out there. The, the birding stuff on the web has just exploded in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, someone asked how to keep squirrels away from the bird feeders. <laughs> yes, you're going to have to let me know when you figure that out. Um, I'm being facetious. That is a constant battle. Um, they make squirrel baffles. So if you put your feeders on one of those poles, like a shepherd's pole, like you might hang flowering plants on, those are perfect things to hang feeders on. Squirrels will climb right up those and get on your feeder. And depending on what type of feeder it is, they might just dump it or drain it um, or just sit in it. I have a little platform feeder that a squirrel gets in now and then, and he literally just sits in like a four inch bath of sunflower seeds and sits and stuffs his cheeks full and then goes and stashes them all over the yard and comes back and does it again. So I made a DIY do it yourself um, stovepipe squirrel baffle. He tries to climb up the pole and he's going inside the baffle and he gets stuck in there and then he falls down. It's worked very well, except one squirrel figured out he could run, jump, hit it, bounce off it, and get up onto my feeder. He was so ingenious and so good at it, I've just let him go. So that guy gets on my feeder now and then, um, but he's not on it all day. He's not damaging the feeders, and he doesn't eat all the food. There are also commercially made baffles. They look kind of, you know, they just look like a, a hat. Um, they're 20 bucks and you can just snap those onto one of those poles to again, prevent the squirrels from jumping up. But you have to have your feeder stand far enough from the fence and the bushes because squirrels can jump and, and you know, six, eight, 10 feet, no problem. So I've strategically placed my feeder right in the middle of the yard where no squirrel can jump from a fence or a bush onto the feeder. They can still try to bounce off my little blocker and get up. So. It's an endless battle. That's another one. Uh, go YouTube that and, and give yourself an hour. It's hilarious. There's great videos out there, people experimenting and then documenting their success. Uh, the reality is I think it's impossible to completely get the squirrels off your feeder. What you want to do is contain them enough that doesn't ruin it for you and the birds. And squirrels don't like thistle, Niger seed. So that's yep, one of that's the benefits the other thing. of Niger. Yeah, the squirrels really love the peanuts and the sunflower seeds, which I like to feed because they draw birds I like seeing and they're very good for the birds. But yeah, indeed, if you just put up a thistle feeder, the squirrels won't mess with it. They want nothing to do with it. In fact, my squirrel can get onto my feeder stand via my thistle feeder. He goes right over it and goes over to the thing with the nuts in it. Um, and likewise, suet, you know, nobody, most of the animals out there won't care about a suet feeder except for the woodpeckers and, and birds like nuthatches. So uh, I'm a big fan of those. They're not messy. They're not expensive. They're very simple. And it's awesome. We have downy and hairy woodpeckers in the yard every day, literally every day, coming to the suet feeder. And again, you kind of kill that. I see, is there a suet for warm weather? There are generally the, the conventional advice is don't, don't feel like you need to do that in the summer. There's plenty for those birds to eat. They need that stuff when the bugs that they eat and uh, the other food sources aren't available. So I generally only run suet during, you know, winter, spring and fall and not during summer. But again, ask that question at um, Wild Birds Unlimited or go online. There's lots of bird supplies online. You know, they may, they have, may have different options for you if you want to do it year round. But most of the people I know who feed birds pull almost all of it for the summer months. It just ends up going to waste. Niger thistle, when it's not fresh, the birds won't eat it. So if you put it out there for two or three weeks and nobody's coming, don't keep refilling it. Just pull it and wait till they need it. You'd be amazed. Even I had it out in the dead of winter. The goldfinches did not care. I saw and heard goldfinches around. I thought they're going to love this thistle. They came nowhere near it. As soon as the weather got nice, I got goldfinches every day out there. I don't, I can't explain that, but surely they had some other food source that was keeping them happy in the winter months when I thought I was taking pity on them and uh, turned out they didn't need me at all. Um, I think we should probably wrap things up. Um, thank you, Scott, so much for giving us your time and sharing your expertise uh, for everyone who's still on the Zoom. 
we will be sending out a link to the YouTube recording along with presentation and some other information tomorrow. So thank you again and everyone have a wonderful evening and ABB. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Julie. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.